Okay, well, welcome back, everybody, to the end of a semester. To me, this has been a, a semester that's gone by in a great hurry. I, I feel actually that it's been, yeah, it's hard to believe for me that it's been 16 weeks, actually, including the Thanksgiving break, 17 weeks of, of time since we started. I know that that's not a lot of time to learn new material and to master that material to the extent that you can do a project. And so I appreciate your being willing to go in the experiment of trying to do this and getting it done. I know that there's a lot uh, of effort that's required to do that. And so today, I don't have, besides the usual of telling you that this is uh, videoed, um, the only thing I wanted to say was that uh, if anybody uh, is brave enough to want to continue working in modeling, uh, I teach in the spring a course on uh, multicellular modeling, uh, E443, 543. Uh, that will take the ideas that you've had here, where we're looking at individual ODE models and put them in a spatial context. Uh, traditionally, that course has been built around simulating cancer, uh, tumor development, and uh, antigenesis, and the interaction of cancer cells with uh, blood vessels. Uh, in the past year or two, we also have done modeling of uh, viral in infection and immune response in tissues. So this is what would be called in-host modeling. Uh, at the end of the class, uh, we built an in-host model of somebody being infected with influenza and then the immune system clearing it. Uh, TJ has spent a lot of time over the past year building models of the spread of virus, uh, cell to cell, the replication of virus within cells, uh, the uh, immune signaling that goes on in tissues and the lymph nodes, which we talked about in a very general way in the past few classes, and then modeling explicitly the many kinds of immune cells, macrophages, neutrophils, CD4 and CD8 plus T cells, uh, all of which play a role in the very complicate, complicated orchestration of uh, immune response that leads to clearance of virus and tissues. And so I know that Colin and uh, Delaney had talked about the possibility of, for example, doing a model where you combined a model of uh, HIV viral load with a model of infectious spread in the population uh, you can use this kind of agent-based modeling to do that, uh, where you'd model the interactions of individuals, the probability of their infecting each other, uh, and then each individual in, individual would have a model of the viral load uh, in, in, in that individual separate. Uh, one of the things that is that, that we've faced with antimony is that it doesn't have a you can do it, you can run multiple antimony models at once, but there isn't a natural language for creating multiple instances of the same model. And that's something that we would do next semester. Talking about running 10,000 models of viral replication at the same time, each one of those in a different individual, and seeing how they interact. So those are things that we could do together next semester if people were interested. And that'll be, assuming Omicron allows it, will be in person class. It will also be project-based. The material for those classes is uh, something we've developed a lot over the years. Um, you, can, you can see it online if you're interested. Uh, there are recordings of the lectures and also the summer school that we teach each year, which covers the same material. So without taking more time, we're already 15 minutes into our a lot of time. Uh, who who is the brave person who would like to present first, or shall I pick somebody? Uh, I I can get I it can out of the way. 
Great, Benjamin. Thank you being, for being brave on that. I appreciate it. Let me turn over the screen share to you. Okay. Um, yeah, let's just. Uh, this works well enough. Is this readable as a uh, sort of a uh, uh, a, a way of seeing it. Does this look good? All right. So uh, my project was on uh, competition within uh, co-infection of, vir or of uh, viral infection. Um, oh, sorry. Well, actually, I was going to say you, your your slides are over overlaying your uh, Nano Hub app a little bit. Is that intentional? Uh, <laughs> they're, they're after. That's fine. Yeah. Well, I, I, I. Yeah. I'm so sorry, uh, I when it's fine and it does, but I just wanted to make sure that it was what you intended. Yeah. Well, when I uh, want to go over to the Nano Hub okay. app, I'll just okay. Okay. go over to it. Okay. So why don't why don't why don't you start from the top so I don't interrupt your 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 nice presentation? So go take take it from the top. All right. So uh, my project is on uh, competition between uh, viral co-infection. Um, uh, down here is a link to the. Um, uh, is a link to the NanoHub app. Uh, I will put it in the chat. And uh, uh, there's a, a bit of a uh, side note on that, but we'll get to it when we get to the app. Um, so to start with biological context, uh, we just need to start with a very simplified uh, viral. We need to understand a simplified cycle of a viral infection, which is that you have viral particles which lack the ability to reproduce on their own. So they must hijack the infrastructure of healthy cells. Uh, then you have the healthy cells, which when infected become eclipse cells, which are uh, infected by a virus, but not yet producing virus. And then uh, once they begin producing virus, they are, um, uh, in fact, they are infected cells uh, and these will die eventually. Uh, so the, uh, of course, this model is on co-infection. Uh, so more than one virus can, can, can compete for the same target cells. Uh, it is of note that infection happens in areas. So an infection in different areas are not for these purposes co-infection. If you have an infection in the lungs and an infection in the liver, uh, that is not for the for these purposes co-infection. Uh, so this competition uh, adds a new dynamic to any kind of system. Uh, viruses are no different in this, this aspect. Um, and the target cell population represents a vital finite resource. Um, uh, as we will see later, time uh, is also a factor uh, that needs to be accounted for. Rarely will two infect infections begin simultaneously. Uh, so the source that this, uh, that this project is a uh, recreation of it is replication of co-infections of the respiratory tract viral competition for resources by Lubna Pinky and ha Hannah M. Uh, Dobrovolny. Uh, and we can see that paper here. Uh, it looks to explain the phenomenon present in the dynamics of co-infection through competition alone. Uh, if it's experimental data uh, to a simple co-infection model to get individual parameters for viral infections of the lungs, and it puts those parameters found from the experimental data into a double infection model, uh, the key output of this model is the viral load. Uh, it finds that uh, some phenomena of co-infection is explainable through competition alone. Uh, that there are, uh, there are other aspects of co-infection uh, that do not need to be included to explain uh, some of the phenomena that you see uh, in instances of co-infection. Uh, there is a, a fairly lengthy portion of the paper that goes over the uh, weaknesses born from the simplicity of the model, 
uh, viruses, for example, may co-infect co cells themselves uh, or go after different cell populations while still being in the same area. And both of those uh, would uh, sort of destroy the premise of this uh, being that they are competing. Uh, it also fails to account for mechanics of immune response, for example, uh, portions that were in the, the paper that were not in the replication. Uh, uh, there was an in vitro experiment that they did, uh, I believe specifically for influenza. Uh, uh, ob obviously, uh, that is not something that I have the resources to, uh, uh, to replicate. Uh, there was also a, uh, a portion on uh, fitting their data to the model, uh, which I uh, did not gain access to. Um, and there was the effects of different viral loads, uh, which was uh, simply just not replicated. Um, uh, so uh, the model itself um, in single infection uh, based on the previously explained uh, simplified infection cycle uh, is uh, built using ordinary deferential equations and it is just target cells becoming eclipsed cells which become infected cells which produce virus. Uh, the TEIV model with double infection uh, works similarly. Uh, the difference is that uh, there are now uh, two different populations for the different viruses, both of which are drawing from the target cell population, which simulates competition for a shared resource. So these are the model parameters as explained uh, by, in the paper by Piki and Bill Bravoni. Um, uh, T is the target cells, uh, E eclipse, I infected B viral as um, as explained earlier, uh, beta will represent the infection rate. Uh, K or one over K is the transition time from eclipse to infected. Uh, delta or one over delta is the lifespan of infectious cells. P is the rate of increase of viral titer per infectious cell. So it is how much the, uh, the infectious cell uh, creates. Uh, C is the clearance rate of the virus, so the death rate of the uh, virus. Uh, V0 is the initial virus amount, uh, and T0 is the initial amount of target cells. Uh, there are also two uh, variables that are relevant to the model that are not uh, explained here because they aren't really parameters. Uh, T is uh, the amount of time that is happening. It is uh, the, the time over which things are happening. Um, and X is the amount of time a virus will be staggered in the staggered model. So this is the mathematical uh, uh, chunk of the model. Um, uh, beta times T times V is the amount of target cells being converted into eclipse cells. K times E is the number of eclipse cells beginning to produce viral particles. Delta times I is the number of infectious cells dying. P times I is the amount of virus produced, and C times V is the amount of virus being destroyed. Uh, though not shown, the variable X is used to control the length of time between infections. Uh, so uh, this is the generic model uh, that was used to implement this. Uh, the screenshot that I took of it was specifically uh, one for RSV. Uh, the single infection model also uses this generic model. Uh, and in fact, the screenshot was a single infection model. Uh, the way this is accomplished is by setting uh, everything to zero for uh, the populate for one of the populations. In this, uh, in this case, uh, the virus one, uh, with the virus two being RSV. Uh, and staggering with variable X was accomplished by uh, setting the staggered virus population to zero until time X, at which point it became equal to the starting viral load as determined by the source paper. Um, widgets were also uh, widgets were implement implemented, uh, being sliders and drop-down boxes uh, used for the purposes of exercises. 
Uh, there were some coding difficulties with log scale and widgets that made it more feasible to simply let the graphs be at a normal scale, though it is only one of a number of factors for that decision. Um, and there was a difficulty in displaying legends, which was circumvented by renaming populations to what was, uh, what was wanted to be displayed on the graph. Um, and not noted here because it was only, uh, I only found out about it this morning and uh, have since pushed a, a, a fix to, uh, to the nano hub uh, that has not been, uh, uh, that has not been uh, approved yet. Uh, so when you open up the app, uh, this problem will still be around. Uh, as a, a as a, a a bug created by uh, by renaming populations to what is wanted to be displayed on the graph, uh, due to some uh, frankly embarrassingly sloppy coding on my part, um, uh, the first of the uh, uh, when you run the uh, the 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 application. Uh, the first of the uh, of the uh, why I my mind's blanking on exercises. There it is. Uh, the first of the exercises uh, will uh, run an error that it uh, that I it usually that doesn't during testing. Uh, because uh, the uh, name of the model gets redefined later um, uh, and uh, has different names in it. So uh, they, I currently have opened the fix for that uh, when we go through exercises. Uh, the, uh, I get simple fix uh, that was only uh, a problem because of sloppy coding on my part uh, was that uh, the model here was named model one. Uh, and then the model here was also named model one. Uh, this is now named model zero um, on this fix. Uh, but so uh, the exercises on the app are constructed in two parts, a try it out that asks the user to engage with the application and uh, does so through widgets. And we think about it, which asks the user to engage with the material, uh, asking them to think about what the rep representations mean. Uh, this double structure mirrors the application's biological context and then model explanation duality. Um, there are three exercises total, one for each section, uh, which we will go through now. So in the single infection model, um, you have biological background and then model explanation, and then you have the uh, try it out, uh, which asks, users to manipulate a single infection model uh, and to make a viral population that never grows. Uh, so for example, here, you can drag the P. Uh, uh, if you get it low enough, uh, the viral, the uh, virus will never grow. Uh, and then the think about it uh, asks you to uh, look back and see what do each of the variables represent. Uh, and when you have simulated a virus that does not grow, what are the uh, what are the variables uh, set to? Why does it make sense that a virus with these properties would not be successful infecting someone? So you can go back up and uh, locate P, which is how much of a virus a single virus producing cell makes over time. So it makes sense that a cell that is not going to produce very much virus is not going to uh, make for a, um, uh, a successful infection. Uh, then there is the, uh, the second one, uh, which is in the double infection model, uh, which asks you to choose two of the given viruses. These are the viruses that were used in the uh, paper that was replicated. And then find uh, one virus uh, that dominates another virus, but is dominated by a different virus. Um, and also which two viruses compete most equally. And uh, it also asks if uh, competition between viruses reduces the total percentage of cells killed by infection. So you can see parainfluenza and uh, metanoimovirus uh, 
out of all of them seem to compete most equally and uh, they kill or the percent of target cells dead is, uh, you know, most of them. Um, uh, and then if you change it to something that uh, has less competition with it, like influenza, uh, you can see that uh, there is a, a bit more of a, um, uh, of a, uh, uh, a bit a larger percent of the target cells dead. Uh, and then the think about it uh, asks you to recall why a virus can get out competed uh, and why that might not be a good idea to have at least uh, to have that as your method of suppressing a virus, uh, being that uh, the uh, the way that these viruses are suppressed is that a person's lungs are uh, being destroyed are being uh, converted into virus. So maybe uh, not the best way to battle a virus. A bit of a scorched earth policy, as it were. Um, and then finally, in the section on a uh, on a delay over time, uh, it asks you to uh, it asks you to take a um, a population that was uh, previously uh, dominated by another and see how far you need to stagger it to change that dynamic uh, such that uh, RSV uh, is produces much greater than uh, influenza in this case. Uh, and then I ended it uh, with the with final uh, asking a question about uh, uh, why would the variable be particularly hard to gather data for in real life and uh, uh, sort of expanding outward to a general question on uh, the usefulness of uh, a model as a tool in these cases uh, where data might be wanted but may be very difficult to get. Um, and uh, as a, uh, since this is to be used as a tool for teaching modeling, uh, I think that is a sort of a, a good note to end on, is uh, thinking about modeling as a whole. Uh, as for my results, uh, with the um, uh, as compared to the the paper that I am replicating, uh, it may be a bit difficult to uh, compare, but uh, in both single infection and double infection. Uh, quantitatively, I appear to uh, I appear to agree with uh, Pinky and Bill Roboli, which makes sense because I am using both their model and their parameters. Uh, there was a small qualitative disagreement that I, I think was interesting. Uh, our results and conclusions are the same, but our focuses are slightly different. Um, uh, Pinky and Dobrovolny uh, focus more of their shown analysis on RSV, whereas a lot of my focused analysis uh, goes towards influenza uh, sort of uh, trouncing RSV. Uh, and the source of this uh, qualitative disagreement is the aforementioned difficulty with the log scale uh, in which uh, on a linear scale, influenza appears to uh, vastly outcompete RSV, but on a log scale, RSV appears to uh, almost take a no hit from influenza. So uh, 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 conclusions, um, Pinky and Dol Bravoni uh, mentioned some paradoxical observations in co-infection. Uh, some data suggests that co-infections are much more deadly than single infections, and other observations find that they are no worse than single infections. Uh, the model explains how both can be true. Uh, on the side of repression, uh, an infection may barely catch hold in competition with another, especially uh, when one has the time variable on its side. Uh, but in deadliness, uh, you 
must remember that the mechanism for this repression is a scarcity of healthy cells. Um, uh, we, I similarly concluded uh, to Pinky and Dolbrovolny that the time variable uh, is uh, a, an important factor in determining the success of a virus in competition. Uh, as for what to do next, uh, there's more than ample room for growth in this, uh, both the application and the model. Acknowledge that this is a seriously limited model. Uh, it could be expanded to include more viruses or to simulate more aspects of dynamics uh, of present viruses. Uh, on shorter term goals, uh, I would like to have more visuals and to improve visuals. Uh, as well as have a greater representation of the non-viral virus moving parts, uh, because though uh, Pinky and Dobrovolny, uh, their graphs were focused on uh, the, uh, the viral output, uh, I think that there might be some, uh, there might be some value in uh, seeing analysis of other aspects of the model. Uh, and then I would also like to add a short section on uh, varying the starting viral load as Pinky and Blubble did. And that's the reference for the source paper. Great, thank you. Questions from the audience? I was running it along with you. Were other people able to launch the app? Yes, there was. I encourage people to, to do that. And and if you weren't able to do that assignment 12 of reviewing somebody else's app in advance, you could do it now. Uh, I understand it's late, but it would still be good to do that, have that available for people. Other co questions or comments? I thought that would, thank you, Benjamin. That was a great uh, lead off a uh, presentation. I think I think it might be interesting. You talked about the the source paper talking about the apparent paradox that sometimes caution makes things much worse. Sometimes it could be protective. Sometimes it seems to have no effect. Might be worth putting some text to that effect at the beginning of the app, because that would be a way of getting people interested in in the result. And maybe having a little bit of, of a comparison where you called out, you, you, you talk about try this out and explore, but it might be nice to have maybe as a supplemental text document uh, or perhaps in, in, the, uh, in the app itself, some particular cases of interest where you could definitely see in this situation, one of the viruses dominate, you change the delay the other virus dominates or the other virus disappears. So you might want to try think about calling out some specially interesting cases. I did um, in the application. Uh, I didn't show it in the, uh, in the presentation because uh, it didn't seem to fit well in the, uh, the slide structure. But um, uh, in the application, there is uh, a uh, it goes over RSV uh, and then uh, the uh, the appearance of uh, influenza dominating RSV and then uh, with a difference in time uh, how you can change that dynamic. I guess I might change the word stagger to something like delay time you know, delay before second infection or something like that. Uh, stagger maybe isn't always isn't such an obvious uh, term. And then there was one other thing I saw playing with the with a simulation, and it seemed to be unique to this particular pair. But um, when you use You might want to think about that log log scale on the y-axis as a possibility. I think some. I think we saw somebody else who was able to get that work. Um, oh yes, 
if you if you selected metanumavirus versus RSV, it looked like there was a computational problem. And let's see which order was it: metanumavirus and RSV. Yeah. If you put RSV first and metanumavirus second, it looks like maybe there's a problem with the computation. Then you try it out. Uh, I believe, uh, and, uh, as you said, uh, it would probably be solved by uh, the log scale. Uh, it is just that the um, uh, the the amount of virus is on uh, uh, sort of uh, different uh, differing levels of power. Uh, oh, uh, that does not happen on my. Oh, uh, that is because the uh, the stagger. Uh, the way that it works is it sets the it sets the time scale to um, uh, so that when it hits that time it suddenly becomes uh, the starting amount. So for metanoimovirus, it's uh, uh, a bit over 1,000. So, okay, uh, so it's because you're starting with a high, high force of infection for metanoimovirus. Yes. So that might be something you want to explain. And so basically what's happening here is because the Y scale is not as small that fact that 1000 is visible, whereas if I go down here, where the scale is 800,000, you don't see it. Interesting, good, good explanation. But that's something you might want to, you might want to explain um, either in the, either in the text of the document or, or in that supplemental, if you're doing in report. Because because this this looks a bit it, this looks a bit odd, uh, because you expect uh, you you would expect uh, as you say if you start out at a thousand and then you're coming down, so that in that case maybe adding a table that had uh, the initial values under the different conditions and the parameter values, you showed in your in your slides you very nicely showed the. Uh, you showed the uh, results for, uh, you showed the, the table of, of parameter values. That might be something you want to add to the main, the main, uh, to the, to the uh, app. And I guess the other thing was your app comes up in edit mode rather than app mode in the, in the version that I loaded. And I think uh, Giuliano sent around yeah. instructions for how to change that. Yeah, I uh, I implemented the uh, instructions that Giuliano sent out, so um, I assumed that uh, it would open in application mode for other people, and that it was uh, opening in uh, the other mode because uh, I was the um, uh, the uh, the sort of owner of the yeah. <clears throat> Was anybody else able to launch it and try it out? Did, did it launch in app mode or when you launched it yourself, would it, did it launch in app mode or, or, or um, edit mode? For me, it launched edit mode. So Drew says it launched in edit mode for him too. So you may want to send a quick email to Giuliano to see about uh, what happened. Because uh, that's a <clears throat> that's a mi minor thing, but it's it's better, better to. You know, okay. Other comments, questions. No, who would like to go next? Thank you, Benjamin, for kicking that off. Appreciate it. We all have to go through this, so so the order the order doesn't change that we all have to do it.
even if you're not finished, today you have to present something, talk about where you are. If, if, if nobody wants to, to volunteer, I'll just go down the list in the, in the Zoom. So, Ali, do you want to, to just tell us where you are with things? Um, yeah, sure. I don't have um, anything new to present from like what I um, showed last week. I've honestly just been um, trying to figure out, I guess, the math behind um, combining two of the, um, I don't know if parameters is the right word, uh, the, like, I mean, would, would you like me to show? I, I talked about it last week, but. Um, like, what would you like me to show the model or just, again? I'm sorry, I'm having, and maybe it's my internet connection. I'm having a little bit of trouble with the sound here. Um, let me check. Maybe. Can you not hear me? Let's see if that's better. I switched, I switched Wi-Fi. Um, go um, ahead again. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, I don't know what you had to say originally. I don't have anything new to present um, from what I had last week. Honestly, right now, I'm struggling just to figure out how to combine um, like two of the uh, parameters, I guess. Um, I don't think parameter is the correct word. I'm like blanking on the correct word, but I'm trying to figure out how to combine L and E, right? Um, I kind of discussed that last week. Um, I'm just, I, I'm like, I want to make sure I get like the rate right from L to SP. Um, and then it doesn't, it won't differ much because for each of these, it's just varies by a, uh, coefficient up front, but um, I don't know if I'm just overthinking the math behind it, but uh, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, but I also, um, beyond that, I also noticed like for um, the model he had, he has, like for the tree maker, he has it go back into early infection. And that just means like, I guess people who uh, want to say that develop some sort of resistance to the infection, they'll go back into early infection. In his write up, though, he said it's just like if people are treated, if they get reinfected, that's kind of where they go. But then there's also another one in the recovery where it goes back to latent period and not early infection, which I thought was interesting. So I might try to see what happens if I just don't have an arrow at all from T to E or T to L and just do R to L something um, or explore that and just see. But uh, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. I guess I would have thought that T to E would be people who stopped the treatment before they were cured. Yeah, I was kind of confused because Yeah, I, so couldn't like, well, so then I was thinking maybe I could just have it go to from T right to the SPS and or NP, I guess. Unless maybe the reason for having this early infection was so that you could be SP and get treated and then you could test smear negative, I guess. But uh, yeah. All right, well, we'd have, to, we'd have to look at the, his work and, and talk to him. But my guess is the idea is that when you're sick, if you if you start taking the antibiotic, you take the antibiotic until you feel better. But the SPS and NP are people who are symptomatic, and so you take the, the, you assume that people take the antibiotic, and they keep taking it until they feel better when they're asymptomatic, and I suppose that could be either your L or your E phase. But but. Um, 
I mean, some people might stop taking the antibiotic when they were still feeling crappy, but in general, people take the antibiotic until they feel better. And the problem here is that it takes a long time to get rid of, but you feel better before you actually are over the disease. So I think that's why the T arrow has an arrow going back to E. Right. That's a good question. Well, then if I am like, because I said I was going to explore, I guess, just removing E and combining it, I guess, with L, I need to uh, change this end of the diagram, too, to see if I can reflect those changes. Um, well, I think if T pointed to L instead of E, I don't think it would make a big difference. Okay. Anything else you want to show us today? Yeah, that's all I have right now. I was trying to Mike make a nice flow chart that could kind of show a better difference between the, the model I'm kind of building off of his and then the original one, but I'm not that uh, fluent with flow chart making, so it's a work in progress right now, but um, I'm working on it. Thank you. I sent I sent around some links for for software that helps you draw things like flowcharts and arrow diagrams. Um, okay, I'll I, I take another look. Then. Um, it's it's not none of the software is perfect, but I sent a couple of free as links to free packages that let you do some of that. So I hope that that's helpful. okay. Great. Um, I guess. Uh, Colin and, and Delaney, do you want to go next? We can. I was just about to use the restroom real quick. If you could skip over us and come back to the next one. <laughs> okay. Yes, it's a long sit. Drew, do you want to go next? Um, I can. Let me... Let me find a way to share my uh, presentation because my nano hub is like under review or something for updating it. Uh, I, I tried using Google Colab, but it seems to just not work the way I want it to. Yeah, unfortunately, the, the widgets are slightly different in Colab and nano hub. Yeah, that's what I found out in Colab. I can't. It seems to always want to output every single one of my plots anytime you press something. So. No, oh, that's that's something. Okay, I don't. I'm not a collab user, but my get that that happens. I know, I know when you use yeah. Spider as a as an IDE rather than Jupyter Notebooks, the default settings for how plotting is done, whether they're mm -hmm. overlaid or whether they're separate, are different. And so then, in principle, you can use show equals false, show equals true to do things like that. But and, and the matplotlib functions allow you to control that. But but it does require some work because the defaults are quite different. Uh, you don't you don't have a Jupyter notebook installation on your on your local machine that you can try things out on. Uh yeah, I'm. I'm thinking. I'm trying to just upload it right now. Upload so it into the you. general, general. But you can also upload to the Nano Hub, just the general Nano Hub uh, Tellurium. And run it there. Well, I'm trying. Uh, I'm trying to share it with you. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. Fine. Sorry. I, I Okay. I think this is a link to download the notebook. Uh, I'll open up my presentation.
All right. Uh. Okay. Can you see this? Alright, um, so I've got the, for my project, I chose to do the Tyson paper on uh, the cell division cycle with CDC2 and cyclin, and uh, here's a link to it. So for my, uh, for the background on the process, uh, there's two parts of the cell cycle, there's, there's growth and then there's division. And uh, this model is focused on the uh, what controls the division cycle. And uh, there's this maturation promoting factor that's uh, formed by uh, CDC2 and cyclin. Uh, and it's a multi-step process. Um, so it's formed as an inactive complex. And then there's an extra step where it's I think dephosphorylated, uh, I should probably double check that, but, and uh, it depends on these different things. And, and in the paper it describes, we're gonna see three different states that this model can operate in and it's gonna happen in different sort of environments and different cell types. Uh, but this is the process here. And uh, you can see that there's quite a few steps, but mainly, I think I don't really need to go over these in detail because the model's going to show what exactly happens. But uh, basically, you've got cyclin, and then it's phosphorylated, and you get pre-MPF, and then uh, nuclear division's triggered, and then we get phosphorylated cyclin, and then it just loops around. Uh, but the this is the model and the, there's six equations differential equations but in my model i've represented them as arrow equations and i think it's a little easier to read that way uh, but the important variables that we're going to graph are cdc2 cdc2 phosphorylated and cyclin and the different activated states of mpf uh, and we can also control some of these uh, constants that are in these equations, uh, specifically the ones that are adjustable. And then here's the three states. So there's a steady state, uh, an oscillator, and an excitable switch. And depending on the values, mainly of K4 and K6, we're going to see how it affects the end state of the graph but uh yeah so we'll go ahead and take a look at that this is seems kind of in my way in my tabs <laughs> it's up here all right um so this is for now just the local version of it uh when it's on nano hub i won't have all this code in the way but uh, here I provide a background, basically the same thing that's in the slides, uh, except I've represented my equations here as uh, the arrow equations, and you can see which directly these constants apply. And here's my model. And so yeah, there's a bit of a background explanation here. I'm going to add, I want to add more to this explanation for the model because I can probably describe how to mess with these constants. But uh, yeah, so this is the, the base part of the project. And you can see that with like lower values of K4 and K6, if they go low enough, there's no oscillations. But there's sort of a middle window here for both of these, and if they go too high, if K6 is too high, we get some sort of steady result at the end, and the same with K4. 
if it goes past a certain range. But apparently, K6 needs to be high enough too for that. Uh, but we'll see the window there. There's another experiment later. Uh, and then K, let's see if I can get this to reset. Uh, so K8 and K9 are also adjustable. They're just supposed to be above a certain point, and I've already put them there on this range. And uh, you can see that they don't really seem to affect the uh, state that it's in, but it does change just the values on the y-axis of uh, CDC2. There's also controls for how long we simulate and how many points there are. Oh, and also we can toggle all these switch, all these switches to view a specific uh, chemical there. And so this graph, I've chosen to uh, plot uh, the pre-MPF versus YP, which I'm pretty sure is cyclin P, yeah. And so if we graph these together, we get this, I forgot what this is called, like a phase something. I, it, yeah, like a, fa a phase diagram something, I, I don't know. But it, the loops here can uh, describe, or a better way to look at how the simulation behaves. And again, so if we choose, Right now it's sort of in a big loop here so we can tell it's oscillating because these two are like out of phase from each other. But if I go too low here, we'll see that it isn't in a loop anymore. And that means it's not oscillating. Um, I don't know, I don't need these controls here, but again, and you can see that at least in this graph that uh, K8 and K9 constants seem to have no effect because, again, all they did was change the y value. So we can do a parameter scan. I don't know why I have that here. Oh, here it is. Where we can control just k8 and k9 just to see. And it does take a while to run, but uh, we get this sort of plot. So you can see this is more useful to judge which values of K4 and K6 are going to result in oscillations here. And so there's a sort of middle window uh, where it takes both of them to be in this range to uh, result in an oscillating simulation. Uh, but again, you can this key is broken, but you can see that the red here, this is the steady state uh, with high MPF activity. And then we've got the excitable switch over here, which is low MPF activity. And uh, I think those are all the exercises I have on here that look at different parts of the model, but that's what I've got. So what, I mean, that, that phase diagram is a nice touch, being able to generate that. With maybe some text on what, what people would learn from looking at that phase diagram would be helpful. Right. Um, I did put sort of a explanation on this, but honestly, I could probably do some more research on these phase diagrams too, because I've not really worked with them before, but uh, it does, like, in this graph, I can tell that this is a, the excitable switch with low MPF activity because it's, like, breaking outwards. And then if I can get it to loop again. But, yeah, I, I've got somewhat of an explanation there, but it could probably, probably put some more detail there. I guess I was thinking also for that, that parameter scan, it might be nice to explain what people see. Does that only do it work once? Because when I'm trying to, ch I'm changing the parameters. 
And I'm not perimeter scan. Redraw. Yeah. Uh, I I believe it probably is redrawing because K8 and K9 I don't think are going to have an effect on it. So oh. just really just touching a widget is probably redrawing it. Uh, but actually, yeah, you can see if I increase like simulated points, uh, it did. Okay. More detail in the graph. But yeah, I think one thing I might change is I've got this slide explaining what these different states do and where they're actually occurring. I should probably put that as a description. I'm maybe on the parameter scan. Just to understand what each state is. No. So you un so you know what red, green, and blue and orange really mean. So that yeah. And for some reason on my on my screen, that first exercise where you have base model, it doesn't draw the it doesn't draw the um, well there you go. So you got it there it is. So it's square. Because when you showed it before the duration was Oh, um I've noticed one thing about these displays that's kind of weird. Is you have to run the simulation in order. If you go to the later parameter scan or something, it messes up how this displays. That yeah, seems my kernel might be stuck. Well, I was putting it in app mode, and it was um, it was using that square display, and so things yeah. were not so visible. The, the key that you have, that nice key at the bottom, was over. All out the text was overlaid on itself. So it's, really, it's fussy because the way it looks when you're developing it may not be quite how it looks when you put it in app mode to, to run it as a user. Right. So it makes life a little bit. There you go. See that? That looks great. But I'm not seeing that when I run it. Um, anybody else had the same issue? Yeah, hopefully, I can get my stuff to. Get up on NanoHub soon so I can maybe tweak it. I'm not really sure why it would want to display square. Oh, I see. Oh, and I think it's not redrawing for me because it's still it's still running off trying to calculate that parameter plot. Parameter oh. sweep is very long. Yeah. And so and yeah Again, I noticed that for some reason, if you touch the parameter scan, uh, it's probably a bug that I can fix, actually. If, I can... if you touch the parameter scan and then come back to the model, it's not doing it now. I don't know why. Uh, for some reason, it's not doing it anymore, but sometimes whenever I go and touch the parameter scan and then come back, it'll, for some reason, reset the size of this graph, and I don't know why, and that might be why it's showing the square for you. I don't, I don't know. So, those are things that you might want to, to, to ping uh, Giuliano on. I'm yeah. sure he'd be happy to, to, uh, to help out with some of that cleanup. Any other any other comments or questions about it? Were people able to get it to run? I didn't have any trouble uploading it. Uh, I didn't have any problem uploading it and getting it to run. Benjamin has suggest says that. Um, when you interact with it, it turns into the narrow display. So, I wonder because one thing I did notice is that I had to set like the 
the graph labels, like I set them up here, but every time I update, I notice that I had to relabel them. And it's probably the same thing with the figure size. I probably need a function to update the size of the figures and have that run every time you touch it. I'm just restarting my kernel here. With the app mode. Yep. When you when you launch it, it does the it does the display right. Um, now, as soon as I select something uh, in that first one, it, it switches the display to make it a bit of a mess. So, unfortunately, unfortunately, it's always a bit finicky trying to get these things working on manual. So, so. Uh, Benjamin, were you able to fix the problem? Were you able to find a workaround on that problem? Yeah, so um, uh, that that was the the one that I said uh, for me was just because I was being sloppy and uh, used the same name for different models later on. Um, so my assumption is that uh, uh, obviously you've got a, a much more complex display thing going on than I do. Um, uh, my assumption is that there's uh, whatever's controlling the width of the plot is that um, uh, you are uh, redefining that later on in the app. And then uh, when you uh, get back to it, uh, it's, it's calling or it's uh, pulling on the same, uh, the same name variable uh, rather than the, the intended variable. Right. So basically, there's a configuration that you, that, that that that's getting inherited when you go back to the top. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, so I'm maybe so if you're using if you're using the default <clears throat> the default plotting packages rather than actually explicitly setting the size of the, the display each time. I think uh, uh, the, the solution uh, that you propose of uh, uh, making that uh, uh, set the display as a uh, another function uh, to be called when you interact, I believe that would, that should be. Yeah, if we just find a function that does that. I have to look it up, but uh, I think I know a way to fix that. Yeah, I realize these are not are not trivial to fix. So if people, I mean, again, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to encourage people to, do it, but but if people need more time to get these things finalized. And you want to take an incomplete, so you have an extra week to work on them to, to clean them up. Just email me to that effect, and I can certainly welcome to, 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 to wait to grade the, your results until you're comfortable. I know, I know, it does take some effort to fine tune this. You tried. You said you tried it on Colab. Uh, I did try it on Colab. I think I've got it here. Because yeah, we yeah, actually asked, thought about potentially using Colab instead of NanoHub. Uh, not this. Well, we thought about it for this semester, but we wanted somebody to try it. Um, yeah, well, there might, there might be a way to fix this, but the problem I had with Colab is that everything works 
actually, like my widgets and stuff. I like I can interact with this, and it seems to work the same way. Uh, the only problem is I couldn't figure out, like, whenever I actually create the plots in code, even though I don't have them set to, like, display or anything, uh, for some reason it just shoots out these, like, static plots. So it's kind of making a mess. And I still have them set to close after I do it, and I can't really get them to go away. There might be a way to clear at the end of a cell. The problem is I, I did also look up solutions. Someone said something like, uh, I don't remember if it was with these, this capture command, which is apparently, I use it up here. Like if I do this like pip install command with capture. Right. It doesn't have any output which is good, so I could use that on this cell, but for some reason, whenever I use the capture function, there is an error with my function, and I don't know what that is. I'm sorry, that one, I really... <laughs> it's I haven't weird. played with Colab, I don't... Uh, I, mean, I mean, NanoHub certainly causes problems that I don't know, but at least I've been using it for a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, Whereas Colab, I have not tried. And so I appreciate your trying it out, seeing what it does. Um, I mean, in the long run, Colab may be a better place to do this kind of work because it's, it's more. Now, I probably would have. Go ahead. I probably would have designed this differently if I was using Colab from the start because I noticed uh, whenever I was looking stuff up about this, people proposed using different like something else besides like matplotlib uh, i saw like the plotly or whatever library people were using to put their charts and they were updating better without just getting them a mess and also i probably could have just organized this in a different way and still used matplotlib but uh i don't know i sort of designed it just locally on uh jupyter notebook well that's i appreciate as i say if you have any feedback on that we can definitely try it out i know i know um, you know again the default the default ids are, are slight, always slightly different Be interesting to see what what it takes. Okay. Anything else you want to talk about right now, or are we? That's already a lot. So. I think that's basically what I have that I can cover. Okay. I guess Colin and Ali are. I'm Colin and Ali. Colin and Delaney, are you are you okay now to present? Um, yeah, I think we're good to go. Yeah. Um, Delaney, do you want to pull up the presentation? I can. Pull yes. Up. Sorry, there's stuff in the way. How do I start the slideshow on Google Slides? I'm not familiar with Google Slides. Uh, present on the top right. Top right. Oh, you guys are in the way. Sorry. So <laughs> our project was a mathematical model of HIV and antiretroviral treatment. So we started with some background information on HIV, which stands for a human, human immunodeficiency virus. And it is a bloodborne pathogen, pathogen, meaning you can only get infected if you came into contact with someone who, with someone's blood 
who is already infected. And the main method of transmission is unprotected sex. HIV takes over the host's white blood cells and specifically CD4 T cells. And these cells play a major role in activating and suppressing one's immune system. So whenever you get sick, the CD4 cells are in charge of activating your immune system in order to, for your body to fight off the infection. So um, HIV in, infects more than 1.2 million people in the United States alone. And in one of every seven people that are infected with HIV are not aware that they are infected. So then we did a little background on can it be prevented or cured. Currently, there is no effective cure that will wipe out the virus completely. And there is no prevention that can be done. There is like, you can do antiretroviral treatments if you have been exposed, but haven't had like a positive test come back in order to suppress it, but there's no way to wipe it out from your system. The most updated universal drug used is ART antiretroviral treatment, and it consists of a mixture of several different prescribed and approved HIV medications that you would take every day, and they call it a treatment regimen. And it also, it also decreases the risk of infecting others. So not only does it, um, not only does it help with the symptoms and increase your lifespan, but it also decreases your risk of infecting others and spreading the virus. So these were the papers, the sources for the papers that we use, um, mathematical modeling and numerical simulation of HIV infection model and the analysis of HIV-1 dynamics in vivo. We use the first one to do the in-host models of the infected and uninfected cells. And we use the second one for the ART treatment um, parameters. So then we'd go into how can a virus be modeled using mathematics and differential equations. And this was a chart for the uninfected and infected cells. And then at the end, up to the up to 10 years part, you can see the spike in the viral load. That's the onset of the AIDS syndrome. And then Colin, you got this part. Uh, these were some of the differential equations that the, the one on the left is for the viral load in host, which is what the initial paper we were reading about introduced. And um, it involves three different cell populations, T or uninfected T cells, I or infected T cells and V or simply viral load or quantity within the body. And there are three explicit differential equations with some of the following initial conditions. And we'll get into more of the parameter values as we introduce the application. And on the right is the uh, RT or reverse transcriptase inhibition treatment model, which is what the second paper analyzed. And it actually uses the same differential equations used to model the original HIV model with some different parameter names and valuations. The one big difference being the one minus NRT in front of the K or beta TV. And what that essentially is, is the efficiency of the retro or reverse transcriptase inhibition treatment, which is never quite at hundred percent, even when medical professionals are administering it to a patient. And these are just some of the original simplified models that we'll go into more a bit when we have the application up. Um, but this is the original model that we worked with, which is simply the TIV populations with a birth and death rate of healthy T cells and also a rate of um, trans or translation from T to infected T cells and then the eventual death rate of those infected cells. Along with that, we have the birth and death of the viral load. So also to go into, uh, I can, if you want to stop sharing, I can share. Oh yeah, sorry. Very good. I'm gonna share the, uh, we're still in t communications with the Nano Hub. With some yeah, people. I've been talking with them because I goofed up the first one. I did it through my github.iu.edu. And since that's a private 
um, network, they couldn't access the actual repository. So I had to resubmit it. So it's still under review, unfortunately. But for now we have the app up. Hopefully we'll have the actual application submitted and um, implemented by within the next day or so. He said, he said it should be tomorrow or the next day. So that's good. So then just to introduce the application that we have right now, we have the initial plan, which is to utilize mathematical models as we've discussed to monitor the viral activity of HIV within a host. We also look to model the treatment of this HIV virus by means of reverse transcriptase inhibition, which is one of the main methods used for treating the HIV virus in modern times. And this will be able to at least show the user how a treatment plan for HIV may work and why it is generally difficult for us to control and cure HIV as a, in its viral form. So we mentioned a little bit about the background, which we discussed in our presentation with the ways that it can be transmitted and the ways it's not generally transmitted and what it does to the body. Uh, Delaney, if you want to go into a little bit more about what it does to the body and why prevention is important. Right, so um, targets specifically white blood cells known as T cells, CD4 cells, which suppresses the immune system. So basically the HIV virus is actually replicated within the CD4 cells. So it inhibits their ability to activate the immune system. So as the CD4 cell count diminishes, the, body, the body's immune system is unable to fight off infection. And there's actually four levels to the HIV syndrome or the HIV infection that was in the paper. There was above 350 cell count, which was acute HIV, and then 200 to 350, which was moderately severe, and then 200 or over 200 or 200 to 100 was severely infected and then less than 100 was the AIDS syndrome set in. So there's actually like um, a way to tell how far into the progression of the virus you are based on your cell count. And then it's important to model the HIV so we can get an understanding of the dynamics so that we can understand how to produce a better treatment because although the treatments today can help people stay undetected and not spread the, the virus. There, it is not available to everyone across the world. And it is also, there is st there's still no way to prevent someone from getting the virus as in like needle sticks in healthcare and um, dirty needles, tattoo shops, all that stuff like that, so. Then our, we discussed a little bit more about the actual mathematical representation of modeling viral infections. I went over this a bit last week when we presented our initial model because we talked about the initial paper by Atula and Mohamed Sahib, where they seek to model the behavior and quantity of viral HIV within a host. And we start by discussing how most viral infection network models work. We start with a very basic S2I um, model, which is simply written with these two differential equations. And we explain how the changing parameter values such as B, which is infectivity, or S and I, which are the actual initial values of the, of the cell populations will basically alter the model overall. And seen below is the general diagram that we've been using to explain these models, which is to show that S goes to I at a rate of B times S times I. And again, these models can range from very simple SI to SIR models to very complex. And this versatility is what allows us to introduce concepts such as vaccines, treatments, quarantines, viral death rates, and whatever we really can think of that simulates a real biological background into a network model. We talk a briefly about basic reproduction number R0, which isn't actually mentioned in our initial papers because it's more based off of the viral spread rather than it is the in-host viral or viral count and quantity. But we discuss how if R0 is less than one, it essentially means the viral spread will decrease, which is what you want in the community and you want to change the parameters around so that the model will reflect a less than one value for R0. 
We then introduced our HIV model from the original paper, which has a brief description of the parameters. As we had mentioned, we had seen the formulas a bit before in our presentation and the parameters simply include healthy supply rate of T cells from the thymus, which is what is within our bodies, which is able to replicate these T cells and allow us to, I know, generally allows our immune system to fight infections. We also have the growth rate of these healthy T cell populations and the turnover death rates, along with infection and infection rates and maximum population of healthy T cells. Here's a little bit, another look at the model description that we had, which we went over in the presentation. And we then get into a bit of the activities of changing these model parameters around and allowing the user to more completely understand how these parameter values are affecting the model. So here we allow them to change um, the replication rate of a virus by the T cells, which is gamma, and the rate of infection by health of healthy cells, which is beta. And as we can see, simply adjusting beta and gamma is enough to either increase the magnitude or decrease the magnitude of some of these HIV viral, um, viral oscillations. So they both have a fairly similar impact, impact on the infected cell count over time, both the infection rate and viral reproduction increase, which causes the peak number of infected cells to grow which signifies just a more rapid uptick in viral spread, which makes sense because the infectivity is increasing. So to get a little bit more complex, we will now look into the full model that was in the original paper, which involves the T, I, and V cell populations, V being the viral model, T being healthy T cells and I being infected T cells. We also look at a bit of the parameter changes that we can make. We already changed a bit of these beta and gamma parameters. So now we look at how the replication rate of healthy T cells or alpha can affect this. And as we see, increasing alpha will, again, cause these two sort of the oscillations to go away and increasing the maximum load or Tmax of healthy cells causes the oscillations to violently increase. So then there's a few questions that are posed, which is that based on the model and the parameters, can you basically tell why HIV is one of the more dangerous and unpredictable or long lasting viruses. And one of the main reasons for that is that these really strong oscillations that occur within a host during an HIV infection uh, make it incredibly challenging to essentially fully eliminate within the host because there are going to be constantly peaks and ebbs in the amount of infectivity that is going on within the body. Decreasing the viral infectivity and replication rate will yield a model which oscillates far less than standard parameters. And we can think of this as a mutated weaker version of HIV, which isn't quite as infective or rapid in its replication, which would then allow for the cell and viral populations to sort of reach equilibrium, which we can somewhat see from the balancing out of the flattening out of the oscillations. We then go into the parameter sweeps a bit which we actually changed from, from last week to have to represent fraction of infected cells based on these parameters, which is a bit different. So as you can see, as the thymus or T cell production increases, the overall fraction of infected cells increases, which is interesting because T cells are the healthy cells that the thymus is producing. But this goes to show one of the main themes that we have found within our model, which is that as the general number of T cells increases, whether healthy or unhealthy, the infection will be able to spread faster. So these T cells are not actually combating the HIV virus at all, which makes it very complicated to try to solve and fix. Then we have the death rate of these uninfected T cells, which again, as I mentioned, the healthy T cells dying off actually leads to a decrease in overall fraction of infected cells because there's less cells to infect. Alpha is the replication rate of the healthy T cells, which as I mentioned, as T cell replication increases as more T cells are available, there are more T cells that will be more rapidly infected. That is in course until it reaches about 85% infected cells at which we see sort of a flat line based on the current model parameters we have. And that's again seen in the T max, which flat lines around 85% maximum infected which means that the overall infection sort of stops spreading throughout the body when it reaches that threshold. Then we have the death rates and infection rates, which are very similar. 
and then we explain to the user how these populations are or how these parameter sweeps are basically measuring the fraction of the population with the green line representing the healthy cells and the inverse blue line representing the fraction of infected cells. So then we look to add the ideas from the second paper, which was the infection treatment and viral inhibitors. And some more background on this, as we've talked about, HIV is obviously very difficult to regulate and get rid of once it has infected a host. And due to this complexity, it's really equally difficult to create a vaccine against, which means adding sort of a vaccination equation to a model like this would not be realistic and not really accurate. So rather than implement a vaccine or prevention method, most real world medical professionals have actually focused on drug therapies and post-infection treatments for patient with the human immunodeficiency virus. And this is just to attempt to decrease the amount of infected cells within that patient over time. Since HIV is a retrovirus, it carries single-stranded RNA as its main source of genetic material. And one of the ways that doctors are able to combat a virus like this within a body is with the use of RT or reverse transcriptase inhibitors. And these inhibitors will block the reverse transcriptase of RNA material, which then is able to prevent HIV from replicating itself. And this sort of treatment can be modeled mathematically using a very similar design. We didn't discuss these differential equations in our presentation much, but this is from the second paper and it involves the, oh wait, we did actually. We have the NRT and this is the same, the same three differential equations as used in the previous paper but NRT is the actual, refers to the effectiveness of the RT inhibitor. And if NRT equals one, then the inhibition of RNA transcription is 100% effective. If it's zero, then there is no inhibition at all. And so in these next few examples, we assume that all other parameters are the same as in the initial model, which means the models will be the exact same. And we want to set an arbitrary value for the effectiveness of this treatment. And we'll just say 35%, which is somewhat realistic considering these treatments are still relatively new and almost generally don't, almost never go above around 70% efficiency generally. So the first is an example of the original model with this RT inhibition. And this is to compare it with the exact same model parameters without RT inhibition. And then there are a few key differences in the two models. The RT inhibition model, even when only working at 35% effectiveness, will actually flatten out the infective curve much more rapidly. And of course, decrease the magnitude of the infected cell oscillations. It also causes a slightly later spike in infected cells, which is a common theme we've seen. And another few more examples of allowing the user to play with these parameters by themselves you can see the same beta and gamma parameters being changed around and you have the option to switch between no uh, reverse transcriptase inhibition to see what we initially saw in the earlier slider example, and then to add our reverse transcriptase inhibition at 35%, and you can once again play around at these values. And if we increase the infection rate beta of the RT inhibition model, it basically reflects the no RT inhibition model at a much lower rate for the replication of the virus and for the infectivity of the virus. And we use this model then to essentially analyze how this, how we can change the value for the efficiency of the RT treatment. And so we initially had it at around 35%, which is what this model would look like. But as you can see, if you increase it, it will start to flatline if you increase it far too much, the infected populations take very long to start up. And if you increase them enough, they will go away entirely. So then there's another question that we pose, which is basically what changes are the most noticeable as the efficiency of this RT inhibition treatment increases. And what do you notice about the final number of infected cells or the days before the first peak? So in the real world, doctors are able to treat HIV using these treatments with varying degrees of efficiency. As I mentioned, they're really above 70 or 80%. And when it comes to inhibiting reverse transcriptase in the body, you really don't want 100% efficient efficiency in a drug or a lot of genetic material that you need to survive would fail to undergo proper replication. 
and that would lead to eventual cell death of healthy cells, not just infected cells. And overall, the treatment delays as efficiency increases, the, the uh, treatment will then delay the onset of the initial wave of infected cells within the host. And it eventually begins to actually increase slowly the amount of healthy T cells that are left within the host as the, vi as the virus eventually fails to replicate. We then do a quick last parameter sweep to show the fraction of infected cells as the RT inhibition, the efficiency increases. And as we can see, there's a strong exponential downslope in the fraction of infected cells as the, as the uh, efficiency increases. And when it reaches one, the number of infected cells is almost zero. And just to compare back to some of the reference material, a lot of the models we created within this application do reflect the parameters and equations utilized in the reference paper very well. Uh, the particular papers that we used really lacked a lot of relevant depictions of their model in action and a lot of uh, resulting variables and parameter results and graphs and stuff like that. So we mostly base our conclusions off of what is explained by their text. And the text actually used the model or used to model the in-host HIV dynamics with the RT inhibition treatment describes that under the assumption that T remains constant or the healthy T cells, the viral cells or I will eventually become eradicated for any RT inhibition efficiency that's over zero. And this makes sense because as there are no more cells being created, if there's any sort of inhibition efficiency, eventually all of those infected cells will die off. Uh, this expectation is unrealistic though, and there is constantly a new influx of these T cells being produced, even in the infected host, which then causes the need for N to increase for the virus to be fully eliminated, which we see in the parameter sweep above as it's increased to around 0.9 and 1.0, the, the infected cells are almost completely killed off. So even though these, these mathematical models regarding the dynamics of HIV, both in vivo and as a model of the viral spread throughout a population are really hugely important in treating and eliminate these, eliminating the spread of HIV in the future. Of course, there are a few next steps that we wanted to add on to this project in order to get it to more accurate, accurately reflect a real world HIV model. Delaney, if you wanna go back to the presentation. So some improvements that we would want to make would be to factor in subpopulation demographics if we were to simulate the population and the risk of infection like we were talking about last week and the risk of HIV increase with every sexual encounter, then we would have to counter the effectiveness of the trial treatment on lowering infectivity and even maintain, maintaining um, undetectability in individuals. Um, then we would also have to factor in uh, some people who don't adhere to the treatment every day because it is a daily treatment regimen. And then we'd have to simulate the effect of condoms if we were going to do a um, population. And then we could also expand to see the AIDS portion of the model to simulate the treatment based on CD4 cell count per um, each like node of severity for the virus and then include uh, how the CD4 cell count varies when introduced to another infection such as influenza and then compare and fit models to data sets collected on in-host HIV dynamics. And then our takeaways were that it's not the most intricate or complex model that has been published to date because Doing research, there were a lot of models that had a lot of equations with a lot of parameters for uh, HIV because it is such um, a unique and long lasting infection. But it is an accurate representation of the viral load and the total number of uninfected cells over the course of infection. And we also noticed how many factors one must consider when doing a population simulation, such as gender, sexual preference, age, location, birth and death rate, along with the normal parameters associated to an SIR model, such as infection rate and recovery rate. 
And then we have our references listed. So that was, unless Colin, you have anything else to add? Um, no, I don't think I do. Okay. Other comments, questions? I think it's, it's an interesting part. What was the year of Alan Carlson's paper? The one that you... Hmm. That one. I forget what you... Let me see. It. Let me pull it up. Oh, here it is. That was an older model, actually. It was around. Well, it was copyrighted. But I think it was from... I'm not exactly. You might. You might go to just look it up and. Google Scholar and find out the, the date. So, so I think it's interesting. I, there were, so, so did you say that with this model, if you get the treatment efficacy over 85%, the virus goes away? Didn't well, that is, what the, that is what the parameter sweep showed. Yeah. And that is assuming that the T replication oh. constant, which isn't always true in HIV. So, so one thing you mentioned is that the model agrees with experimental data, but you didn't show experimental data to compare it to, really. Um, it might be nice to actually have some, some viral load curves or CD4 plus T cell time series to, to compare it to. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if, if, if you're talking about the model as a model, then you don't need to show the experimental data. But if you're going to say that it agrees with experiment, then you need to show that. Um, and there are a couple of there are a couple of things on the extension side I would think you could do. One of them would be to the HIV in, in individuals tends to become resistant to the drugs. And you could model that by that efficacy term in the model gradually becoming less. So you start, you, you gave the example of using 35% and then you had a slider where it's a parameter scan where you said the efficacy could be 85% or higher. And you could imagine a, a model where as the virus replicated that efficacy went down, which it does. And uh, that the rate at which it goes down depends on the rate of viral replication. So if, if you if you have very little viral replication, then the rate of uh, evolution is slow. If you have a lot of viral replication, you escape faster. And that could be interesting. The other thing is when you give the drug, well, you give a drug that both dose, the, the amount in your bloodstream goes way up, and then it decays. So you take the drug again, and it comes back up, and then it decays. And that might be important, although it happens on a fairly short time scale compared to everything else um, in the in the model. So those are some things you might want to think about. Um, there were a couple of things that you said that that I think maybe not maybe because you're going from an older paper. I think that paper of Allen's is quite old. 20 years old, maybe more. And so at the time it was written, the, the drug therapies weren't very effective. When they were just using AZT, the drug therapies were not very effective. Now, uh, PrEP, which is a triple drug combo, uh, is given prophylactically. And so, um, there is, in fact, an effective prevention for HIV. And so people who take, uh, it's so effective that people are, are probably foolishly uh, not using the safe sex prevention that they, they that is still recommended. 
um, because the risk of infection is so low uh, for people who are taking the drugs in advance. And so it'd be interesting to see that because if you really have, if you, one of the things that you showed, could we come back to that one where you showed that it, when you had the efficacy of 85%, um, it prevented, it, it just, it abrogated the infection. <clears throat> So that's the parameter sweep, but you showed a you showed a plot above it where you had a slider for the efficacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one. So at 75%, it doesn't get rid of it. If you go up to let's try 85. Okay, so 85, it holds it off for a long time, but then eventually comes back, huh? So for that one, you might want to increase, have some adjustment so that the duration of the simulation uh, is something you can see. So you can see the longer time behavior. Mm -hmm. um, but but why don't you just hit run interact again so we can see that? Okay. And if you if you if you slide push it up to ninety five percent, what happens? So that abolishes it. So one of the things that you might want to think about would be how the infection happens. Because when you're, if the, the infection happens when somebody's exposed and In that case, you're supplying virus to the system. So you, your amount of V would go up. And the amount of virus is naturally cleared. So there's essentially an exponential decay of virus. It doesn't last that long. Um, and then presuming that you're not having a succession of needle sticks or unprotected sexual encounters, you have an initial exposure to the virus, it would be a little blip in V. And you could ask the question, what happens in the follow-on to that? If there's no treatment, then you'll go through this spike of infection that you showed at the beginning, where you, where you did all that analysis. If, on the other hand, you were doing here uh, something where you're treating before exposure, um, you might expect that that if you, if, from what you have here, even if you have an established infection, if the treatment is 96% effective, you don't you you cure you're, you're seeing cure, but you don't see in, in people. Uh, but what what you do see is that if you're at 90, 85% or 90% efficacy with the drug treatment and you have a small exposure, you don't ever get infected. That initial infection goes away. And so you prevent the infection. And I think that that's something that this model could replicate, where you apply a small amount of virus to the system. And if you don't treat, you become infected and you see the oscillation. If you do treat either before or just afterwards, post-exposure prophylaxis, then you in fact see that the virus goes away and you never have an infection. And it would be interesting to know what efficacy you needed for that to work. Because, because you mentioned post-exposure prophylaxis a little bit, but, but it's known that if you, if you are exposed to HIV through either sexual contact or needle stick or something else, uh, and you get hit it with the antiretrovirals 
heavy early, uh, you don't ex you don't prevent everybody from getting the disease, but you prevent most people from getting it. And the reason it's not the reason it's not um, one of the reasons it's not a hundred percent is that when you start taking the drugs, it takes time for their constant, their efficacy to build up. They don't they don't become effective immediately. And so there is this window when you can have virus circulating in your body and provided you stop it and provided you hit it right at the beginning, you can clear the disease. Um, so um, that's not considered a cure in a normal sense because the infection never fundamentally takes off. Uh, but it is a cure in the sense that the, the virus is in your body and doesn't lead to infection. So it's an effective preventive. And so I think it might be worth doing a little more reading about this, because I think the models you have will show that, but I think what's happened is because of the time that was written, which is 20 some years ago, uh, people didn't know that. And so the model is actually capable of showing uh, trap pre-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis, I think. Uh, but Alan didn't, didn't, didn't do that when he wrote that paper because nobody had thought about it. They didn't, and they didn't have drugs that were that good. Um, the, the, the current uh, triple cocktail, um, which is, um, blocking on the, on the trade name of the drug, the drug combination. Um, and there's a newer one now, it's now there, there's a second one. The problem with all of the, the re antiretroviral combinations um, is that they're toxic, they're pretty toxic. Um, and so there's a problem, the problem is that, the problem is that the, uh, the problem is that the, uh, yeah, so there's a new one called Discovy, D-E-S-C-O-V-Y, um, which is a newer one. And then the older one is called Truvada, T-R-U-V-A-D-A. -A. Those are the two standard uh, commercial. Truvada has been around for quite a while, well, several, five or six years now. Uh, Discovery is new. Uh, both of them are fairly hard on the kidneys. And so people who are on those medications for a long time uh, can have kidney failure which is a problem. And so now there's actually a new, um, a new regimen, which has just been introduced. We're just, I mean, again, I'm not, don't keep up with this in the past two years, um, where uh, people will start, um, the initial use of PrEP was that people took the drugs continuously uh, for years. Uh, something that Alan had suggested early on when the drugs were less effective was to give the drugs when viral loads were higher and then go off of it when the viral load went down, which is called the metronomic therapy in the cancer world. In the case of, of PrEP, the original recommendation was if you're going to have high risk sex, or you're going to be exposed through needles, uh, take the drug all the time. And that proved to be extremely effective, extremely effective, but the toxicity was very high. Uh, there was also this regime of people who were unexpectedly exposed to HIV and then took higher doses of the drug just after exposure, called post-exposure prophylaxis. 
Uh, you might want to look those up. And um, in those cases, uh, you have to give a higher dose because you have to, you, you're chasing the, 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 the virus. And so now there's a new treatment protocol, prophylactic protocol, which is if somebody expects to be exposed, for example, they're going to have a sexual encounter, they take a high dose of the drug before that, uh, and then they go on a low dose for a period of a week or two weeks afterwards. And that combines, uh, to some extent, the best of both worlds, because they're taking the drug beforehand. Of course, people don't necessarily know they're going to be exposed, but they're not on it continuously. And so then the, the kidney toxicity is lower. And I think there was a lot of concern about whether that would work, uh, but it seems to work pretty well. And then the, you don't have the kidney toxicity problems, at least as severe. So I think it's worth digging in a little bit more into the current standard of treatment, because I think a lot of those things are modelable. Uh, you start the treatment because the drug takes time to ramp up. You ramp the drug up, you have an exposure, and then you can see whether you can prevent the disease or not. Um, those are, I think, pretty interesting questions that you could ask. There was one other comment you made which uh, you made a comment about the, that if the drug were 100% effective, it would be lethal because it would prevent uh, uh, normal cellular function, DNA synthesis, RNA synthesis. Um, and that's, that was, that's not quite right because the reverse transcriptase the reverse transcriptase that that, um, that HIV uses to replicate is not something that's present normally in human cells. And so you could, even if you block that, if you had magically something that blocked reverse transcriptase 100%, uh, provided it didn't interfere with anything except transcription of RNA to DNA, it wouldn't, wouldn't affect us. Um, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a mechanism that is not normally present in, in, in humans, at least RNA is never transcribed back into DNA and in normal cellular function. In fact, this comes up now specifically in the case of, of COVID and flu, um, RNA is not transcribed, to the, to, is not replicated either, except in one very specific case, which has to do with telomeres. Um, RNA is not replicated. And so uh, COVID and influenza are both single-stranded RNA viruses like, like HIV, but their replication history is different. In the case of, of HIV, <clears throat> you go from RNA to DNA and then back. In the case of influenza or COVID, you go from RNA to complementary RNA, because when you copy RNA or DNA, you go from CGAT to the complementary sequence, and then back. And so in the case of, of flu and COVID, you have a polymerase, not like reverse transcriptase that takes RNA and gives you DNA. You have a polymerase that takes RNA and gives you RNA back. And that's also not normally present or active in human cells. There's this one little exception, which may actually be the evolutionary origin, whether from virus to, virus to animal or animal to virus isn't known, uh, where there does seem to be some sp special cases where there may be some copying that. But in general, 
uh, if you abolished RNA copying completely, you'd be fine. And if you abolished the RNA to DNA copying, you'd be fine. And so it might be worth doing a little bit. You don't need a high, you don't need a lot of detail, but you could look in just Wikipedia. Uh, look at uh, reverse transcriptase uh, and look at uh, RNA dependent on RNA polymerase. Uh, one is the molecule that's key to retroviruses, and the other one is the molecule that's key to normal single stranded RNA viruses like flu and COVID. Um, I mean, one of the reasons people were so shocked when, when uh, HIV and its relatives were discovered was the idea that RNA would be transcribed back into DNA was, was completely counter to the orthodoxy of how uh, the central dogma of biology. And so, so it was unexpected that that's why they're called retroviruses, because the the, the genetic information is carried backwards. The information flow is always DNA to RNA to protein, never RNA to DNA. And that's, that's why retro is there in the name. And so, so uh, I mean, that's not, that's not critical to the modeling you're doing, but you want to be careful when you're describing the biology to get that right. Um, and in general, I thought you did a good job explaining the biology, but that one one point, I think, uh, is probably worth uh, worth looking into a little bit more. But I, I like to. I think it's it's uh, it's impressive that that you. So actually, it's here on the screen. You have the comment that if uh, if. Uh, if the retroviral inhibition were perfect, you wouldn't re wouldn't replicate your your own D your own genome, and that's that's not correct because you're blocking something that doesn't happen in normal in normal uh, cellular function. How 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 reverse transcriptase came about is an interesting mystery, but that's a bit so. So I think I think uh, you've got a lot there, but you could you it might be worth thinking about trying to refine it a little bit, um, and uh, exploring it. It's a very rich subject, and as you point out, a lot of people live with HIV. Um, and. Uh, The flavor, the theory of the month, of course, is that COVID, COVID, uh, developed into Omicron because it was sitting in somebody who was immunosuppressed because of HIV, untreated HIV, and so that's a whole topic of it in its own right, which is the, the interaction. We, we heard a talk on co-infection. Um, in this case, uh, perhaps. Uh, the issue was co-infection between two very different viruses, uh, HIV and, and uh, COVID. So I think I think uh, you've done a great job, but it might be worth thinking about about a few of these issues as you try to try to refine uh, try to refine uh, your thinking a little more. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Ryan, I guess you're the last person on the books. Do you want to uh, go? Yeah, let me just share my screen. <coughs> uh, yeah, so before I start, I, I wanted to say that I couldn't uh, get my model running on NanoHub yet. Uh, I ran into uh, a technical difficulty where uh, when I'm trying to save my model, uh, it, it kind of shows, uh, like it kind of throws some warnings uh, saying that uh, certain states cannot be saved. And uh, I mean, it saves it, it just gives me warning. And then when I'm using that uh, loaded model, uh, the predictions are not coming in right. So I'm uh, still uh, trying to figure out a workaround for that problem. 
uh, but I did uh, like uh, make a few changes uh, uh, from I guess uh, uh, the previous week, and uh, I was able to uh, achieve some better results. And uh, like the, I would, I definitely want to share it with, with you guys. So uh, I'll. Uh, uh, be a relat relatively quicker when I talk about these topics because I've covered them before and I would uh, want to focus more time uh, on the changes that I've made. So uh, these are the five papers. Uh, one, the first one is the base paper. It uh, basically talks about uh, a very simple influenza inf infection. So those four variables that you see on the screen uh, T is basically uninfected cells. So it's like S in an SIR model. I and J are like I in the SIR model. And V is basically, it's uh, it's just a virus title or the, the, the minimum amount required for uh, infecting a virus. Uh, now the papers two, two, uh, two through four uh, talk about uh, uh, the modeling of epidemiological, uh, like epidemiological uh, models uh, uh, which uh, basically become better when they are assisted by machine learning or deep learning uh, strategies. And the fifth paper talks about um, uh, in-host models uh, assisted with AI. So uh, like one central theme of uh, my project was uh, how, how do surrogates basically help with uh, these two different kinds of models. So one thing that is common about uh, these two problems uh, is basically the fact that they are extremely complex and uh, uh, they keep evolving. So uh, uh, to solve them or to have an expectation that you could solve them with, a, with an analytical solution is a little far-fetched. Uh, and uh, uh, even, if you, even if you could do that, it would take like probably a, a huge amount of effort uh, and uh, new problems will keep showing up. So you want something that is far more flexible and far more powerful. And that is where uh, probably neural networks and AI can uh, help. And the idea here is that if uh, uh, an artificially intelligent uh, model or a, uh, a neural network can uh, basically help uh, uh, replicate the, the performance of a analytical model, then uh, it won't stop there. It, it it would eventually do much better than that because it is capable of uh, uh, learning more intricate things. So uh, last time I uh, had a few jumps in my presentation and I, I realized that I, uh, like a lot of people lost me there. So uh, 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 I, I found that feedback very helpful that I need to probably uh, connect those thoughts better. So uh, this time I've included a slide about neural networks and uh, recursive neural networks. So, uh, so basically you can think of a neural network like a deterministic mathematical function. So it's just like Y equals F of X. So the entire neural network is basically just that F. Uh, you have some input and you have some output and you have a bunch of layers in between. So the layers in between are called hidden layers. Uh, and then there's obviously the input and the output layer. Uh, uh, there are activation functions. What an activation function basically means is that it is kind of, uh, I would say for lack of a better word, like squishing values towards uh, the boundaries. Uh, so uh, the boundaries being probably like zero or one or like a high or a low signal. So. <clears throat> that is also kind of the reason why it is called a neural network because it mimics the uh, the firing of a neuron. You could you could think about activation as as a, as the firing of a neuron in in your brain, uh, and uh, 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 this is uh, kind of like a, a, a more nuanced version of a neural network, uh, which which is called a recurrent neural network. So here you are not only trying to uh, somehow abstract the relationship between uh, your input and your output, but you are trying to do that in such a way that you are also able to uh, kind of capture the relationship between uh, like your different elements of your input. So, for example, if your input and your output is a sequence, then uh, not only is your input and output related, but even uh, there is some information uh, involved. Uh, 
like within the uh, elements of the sequence. So for example, if you think about uh, language uh, in a sentence, uh, let, uh, let's say there are like five words in a sentence now, and you want to predict the sixth word. So uh, uh, not only uh, do you want to know the fifth word, you also want to know how the fifth word relates to the, uh, the fourth word and the fourth word to the third word and, and so on. So you want to capture some kind of uh, information that uh, is basically like uh, present in the sequence itself and not just in one particular uh, 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 like instance of uh, input. So that's what an RNN helps with. And you can see that uh, it has like those two things where uh, one is the input and the second thing is basically what comes out of the previous uh, sequence. So both those things are taken into account when you do the prediction. Uh, and LSTM is uh, uh, like is kind of like an advanced version of an RNN, and it was built basically to uh, uh, like tackle the problem of uh, vanishing gradient. Where uh, what happens is that if, if the sequence gets long enough, then uh, this input uh, that comes from that previous sequence it it kind of gets too small. So uh, 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 LSTM basically helps you. So, like sometimes it helps you forget that uh, information that is coming in. Sometimes it helps you uh, like reinforce it. So it, it's kind of uh, uh, making an RNN uh, much more technically uh, capable. And uh, a GRU is uh, a much more compact and a much more uh, uh, like it, it uses lesser things and it achieves the same result as an LSTM. So it's, it's a much more uh, I would say a better design than LSTM. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so that's uh, recurrent neural networks in uh, in short. So the design goals for my project involved uh, creating a surrogate model, uh, which could probably perform better than an SIR model. So in an SIR model, uh, you have uh, uh, you have to give it uh, the the parameters. Uh, you have to give it parameters like beta or uh, like uh, n number of parameters, and you also give the model the starting values of uh, let's say SI and R. So here the idea is that uh, you just look at a sequence of uh, S, I, or R, and you uh, you know nothing about uh, those parameters, and you're still able to predict what comes next. Uh, what is the next value of I? So uh, uh, the, the first point basically talks about uh, the most uh, useful thing in this project where you are uh, not giving it any parameters. Uh, the model is supposed to create an internal representation of the parameters on itself. And it is just, you are only interested in giving it a sequence of uh, those S, I, or R values, and it is supposed to predict uh, whatever comes next. So uh, that's that was one thing. The second thing was, uh, so here the idea would be you would give it probably the first five elements and you would ask it to predict the sixth one. Then you would give it two through six and ask it to predict the seventh one and so on. So uh, when you give it two through six, the sixth value is not the one that you predicted. It is from the real data. So in second point, what we are saying is that instead of taking that sixth value from real data, you uh, use the one that you've predicted uh, using your own model. So that increases the complexity of your uh, of your task by, uh, by a lot. And third is obviously to explore the, the practical application. So we, we talked about uh, uh, in-host modeling and uh, epidemiological modeling uh, in, in, the, in the starting slide. So probably taking a very niche problem like uh, policy change uh, and uh, tackling it with uh, with this. So uh, like th th those were the things that I had in mind when I started this project. Uh, yeah, and uh, the data was generated using that first paper. It had a bunch of uh, uh, range values for uh, parameters that I used to generate uh, about 10,000 uh, simulations and uh, 9,000 was skipped for training and 1,000 for testing. So uh, one major change that I've made uh, compared to the last time I spoke was that uh, instead of uh, passing those parameters, 
uh, into the model, I now pass only the dynamic uh, uh, variable. So there is no more passing of K, uh, beta, and all those other things. Uh, it is just uh, looking at uh, these uh, time series data. So it is just looking at basically these five columns of data, and it is supposed to uh, predict. Uh, so if I if I uh, have like if I have set my hyperparameter as three, then it will look at uh, basically these three rows of all these five columns, and it will predict the fourth row for one of those columns. So uh, the idea is that if we can if we can get it to do that, then we can eventually get it to predict uh, the fourth row for all of these uh, four columns. So yeah, this is just uh, 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 the architecture of the LSTM. Uh, I made it uh, deep so that it won't have a lot of parameters, and at the same time, it has a uh, it does better. Uh, so yeah, uh, coming to the results of uh, how this looks like. So you can see that uh, on the, on the right, you basically have the good results and on the left you have uh, the times when it has performed badly so uh, the only thing that i did different here is one i gave it more data so initially i was working with 1000 simulations now i'm working with 10000 simulations and two i have i'm not no longer taking those static parameters into account so i'm no longer looking at uh, any of those uh, parameters like beta k or whatever so uh, you can you can see that not looking at those static parameters has not really uh, depreciated the value or like the 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 efficiency of 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 this model. It is still able to do uh, almost uh, as well, prob probably even better. And uh, uh, what has helped it do it do better is basically more data. So I think uh, at this point. Uh, an argument could be made that uh, given enough data and even com uh, enough computation, uh, this very model can probably be able to very accurately uh, map uh, the function. So uh, like again, to just uh, reiterate uh, the, the, the plots on the right, you can see that even when they are not in their standard form. So for example, the, the last two, uh, the, the one on the bottom, uh, you, you can see that it's not, uh, it's kind of like a, a variation. Uh, there's a delayed uh, uh, infection in this case, and uh, it is still able to kind of anticipate that delay. So uh, in that sense, uh, it, it's doing pretty well. And then there are also some wildly wrong predictions like uh, uh, on the bottom right of the left, left section of the page. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, again, just uh, I went through this last time, so I would just quickly go through this again. Uh, so some of the things that I've, uh, some of the problems I faced was there was an exploding, exploding gradient problem uh, that could be solved using gradient clipping. Uh, initially, I was uh, concatenating my, uh, 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 like my training data and passing it as one extremely long vector. Uh, and I'm no longer doing it. Now I'm treating every single uh, simulation as a separate batch. So uh, uh, like uh, every single simulation has probably like uh, 80, uh, like uh, like 95 time windows if you're considering a sliding window of three. So those 95 samples would be considered as one batch. Uh, and that helped uh, quite a lot. Uh, I ch um, made changes to my network architecture and uh like the only thing different from the last time i presented was that i used more data and i removed static parameters and uh that too so last time if you remember i think uh, we were getting good results in only probably like 20 percent uh, uh, of the cases here i think we are getting decent results in about uh, 60 percent cases and we have only uh increased uh, the amount of data by a factor of 10 so that uh, seems promising to me uh, two other things I would want to try out is I would want to uh, try out a by LSTM model instead of an LSTM model and uh, see if that is improving the performance. And second thing is, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, just uh, starting from one single time step and uh, predicting everything that uh, that comes ahead. Yeah, so that's uh, all I've got. Uh, I would be getting uh to having this deployed on nanohub uh 
uh, by the end of this week for sure like uh, um, positively by tomorrow uh, and in, in the worst case by the end of this week so what i have in mind is that uh, i would probably have like a sliding win, a sliding bar for all the hyperparameters uh, and uh, uh, like you could train the model and you could uh, uh, download the model so if you want to probably tweak those hyperparameters on your own and see what happens uh, you could do that uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, questions, comments? Thank you for adding the explanation of the network architectures. It was helpful. Uh, could we come back to that slide where you showed your results? Because I wasn't sure I understood it. Yeah, sure. So what we have here is you're predicting what? You're predicting T? Uh, yeah, I'm predicting T, that's correct, yes. And it would be helpful if you plotted the other ones too, the, the, the other variables. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, so I kind of got sidetracked because of that uh, saving problem. So I had to retrain this uh, today morning, uh, ah. but yeah, um, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely do that. Um, because it would be interesting to know why it works sometimes and doesn't. In other words, in the ones that don't work, is are all the values very small, for example, and so it's basically not distinguishing them? Uh, yeah, that is definitely uh, something that I would have to look at. Uh, like, uh, like uh, the the obvious uh, thing that catches my eye here is that in in the bottom example where there's that uh, uh, very delayed. In fact, so green is basically uh, the actual data, and red is the the predicted uh, data, uh, predicted uh, like the uh, prediction. So. Uh, uh, there being such a huge delay in the infection is is very rare. I, I think there would probably be just like three or four of such simulations in that entire ten thousand uh, uh, like data frame. So, uh, uh, yeah, in that sense, it makes sense. Like it, it makes sense that the neural network was not able to capture it because it was dealing with a, a very exceptional uh, case. Uh, one thing we could do about uh, things like this is that we could uh, potentially identify the outliers of the data and we could uh, give more weight to those inputs. We could probably like multiply that by 10 so that uh, even if it shows up, uh, the, the neural network has some way of dealing with it. But yeah, again, it is uh, like uh, on the on the top, you can see that uh, the infection is like it's pretty straightforward. But uh, the the model took time to kind of uh, uh, like it. There was a delay when the model said that okay. Uh, so uh, those those cases still baffle me. I'm not entirely sure why uh, that's happening. Uh, so well, the other thing I was going to ask is, do you, do you, did you try taking the logarithm of the values before you trained? So in other words, training this network not on the values, but the log of the values. Uh, yeah, right now, what I'm doing is uh, I'm doing like a sta uh, standard norm, like a standardization of the data. So uh, every uh, row, every uh, column is individually uh, like kind of uh, evenly distributed about its uh, uh, like, uh, 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 okay, I forgot what stand, standardization meant. So basically it's like that Gaussian curve thing where you have uh, the maximum of your values are distributed uh, uh, along your mean and then uh, it's symmetric on both sides. So it's doing that to every single column of the data. Uh, that is what is being trained on. And then before plotting this, I am reconvert, like rescaling it to its, uh, uh, original value, but yeah, I've not tried right. the logarithmic thing. Well, because at the beginning, the 
the the number of un, the number of infected cells is very few, or the amount of virus is very small. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, the time it takes for the infection to take off is extremely sensitively dependent on those values. Uh huh. Yep. And those values are very small. Yep. Yep. And so, that if you sense. normalize everything so the maximum is one, mm -hmm. then you basically are eliminating those small values because you you're you're rescaling things so you're compressing at those values out and and that that could be why you're seeing these delay problems because a factor of 2 if the initial value is 10 to the minus 6th that gives you a delay i don't know of 20 if the value mm -hmm. is 10 to the minus 7th it gives you a delay of 60 if mm -hmm. the value is 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6, the delay is 10. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, but 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7 are all essentially zero when you compare it to one, which is the maximum. Yep, yep, that makes sense. And so in those cases, if you take the logarithm and you train everything on the logged data, mm -hmm. then potentially you, you see those small values then become important. Yeah. Because you can see sense. the difference. And, and of course, you can't take the logarithm because you could have a zero. So you have to take log of value plus one mm -hmm. to get rid of the zeros. But that may be that may be something that would help you. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then and then you're predicting the log of the value rather than the actual value. So then to plot it, you have to take the exponential. <laughs> but I think yeah. that would be worth looking at. Yeah, one, I, think, I think that may be what's happening, why, why the delays are mispredicted is because they're sensitive to very small values that you're not here that the, that are not being seen. Uh, yeah, and like adding on to that one, one like interesting thing uh, that I uh, saw when I was doing this was that different uh, variables uh, are getting like a uh, trained in different like uh, the errors are different for different variables so for example uh like i think uh, uh i think t is uh, t and j are doing like the best and uh, v is v is probably p, v was probably doing the worst so uh yeah that totally makes sense that uh, it's probably got to do with uh, the sensitivity of uh like how how the other variables change yeah if you started later in the infection when none of the values are small, it would be easier. But when you start at the beginning where the initial infection is very low, very weak, mm -hmm. everything is super sensitive to a small, a small number. Yeah. And net, the neural networks tend not to handle that very well. So that's why a logarithmic compression might help. But otherwise, yeah. it's interesting. You've made a lot of progress from last time. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is not... Uh... So like uh, we are not solving a redundant problem anymore. This is like it it does not know the parameters. Right. So no. this has utility. Yeah. Right. So then you could actually begin to do the do the the uh, the the, uh, the LSTM to actually find out what the parameters were to give you the to give you the adjust the tracking that you want. Yep. 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 No, that's that's good. Okay, well, everybody, thank you. I know we're not quite finished, and it's the end of the semester. So again, tell me, let me know if you want to be graded on what you've done, or if you want me to wait. Uh, I have no judgment either way, but you have to decide that for yourselves. Uh, and uh, I appreciate everybody putting in the work. I know things were not always uh, according to plan this semester. If, if any of you decide to show up next semester, that'll be fine. That course, that course actually is a little bit more organized, uh, or at least I'll tell you, I'll do something, I'll say something different, which is next semester, I'm not going to experiment with the course organization so much. This semester, I tried some ideas out, um, and uh, some worked, some didn't work so well. Uh, I appreciate your patience with that. So, so stay in contact with me. Let me know what you want me to do about grading. Uh, please do get in your homework scores because your homework scores are an important part of the course. But if, uh, if you didn't do a little report on your target uh, 
person uh, presentation. Uh, please do that. That was that homework 12 assignment. Some people handed that in already, some did not. Uh, and uh, I know you have other exams. How many people are done after this, and how many people still have exams or projects ahead of them? How many people are done for the semester when this is done? One. Everybody else still has exams and things. So, so I wish you the best of luck, too. Uh, Delaney, no. Allie, no. So I wish you the best of luck with your other projects and exams. It's been, it's been fun working with you. Uh, if you're done, congratulations. If you're not done, I will continue to work with you either way. So uh, for tonight, we'll, we'll call it an evening. And uh, if anybody has any, uh, says if we get everything in by Friday, are we taking the incomplete? Well, if you get everything in by Friday and you want to be graded on that, I'll grade it over the weekend. I believe grades are due by Monday. So if, if I have, I mean, if you give me everything Sunday night, I can't promise that I'll get it all graded by Monday morning. Uh, but but you tell me if you need more time or not. Um, again, I'm not I'm not trying to encourage you to take an incomplete or not, but I know people have worked hard, uh, and in general, I, I want people to to get the grade that corresponds to the work they've done. I don't want people to suffer because of that. Uh, before we go, uh, sort of related to uh, projects becoming complete after the fact, uh, just shortly after I finished my presentation, uh, it appears that uh, Nano has pushed the, um, uh, the change that I made and inexplicably uh, it is now opening in app mode. I don't know what happened, but it now opens as an app. Okay, that one. Well, congratulations. Let's do you, you share the link and we'll try to figure it out right now before we break. You put the link in the chat. I think I had it, but I just uh, let's take a look. Grind, grind, grind. Okay. And that first and that first exercise doesn't crash either. That now works. Great. Well, that's good news. I'm glad that I'm glad that uh, that that worked for you. Um, I bet the Nano Hub staff are, are are under a lot of pressure because there are probably dozens of groups, uh, courses all over the United States that are having having students trying to get their apps up in time for their for the end of the semester. So uh, that that it opens. Now and it does crash, so that looks great. Congratulations! Thank you for letting us know. It's a nice way to end the the, the day, is that somebody had a success. <laughs>